Uh, we all have people that we wanted to be like. Um, when I was growing up, I wanted to be like Mike. Uh, not just any Mike, I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. <laughs> and as you can see, I clearly am. Uh, I grew up in a, in a house full of boys. The NBA was on all the time. Uh, but I, I would trace it back perhaps to a clever advertising campaign from Gatorade that released in the fall of 1991 to the impressionable young eyes of a soon-to-be 10-year-old and clearly future NBA player named Mark Holmes. Now, I'm going to actually show us a clip this morning, the commercial, um, and, and I need you all to promise that you will not run out and go buy Gatorade now after seeing this commercial, okay? Okay. Uh, I can't have that on my conscience that you came to church to be blessed by the word of God and now all of a sudden you're just funding big Gatorade. Um, in fact, the next time that you are in need of a high energy, high sugar sports drink, I need you to buy Powerade or some sort of Kirkland knockoff. Like that's what we're just, if you're here today, you're agreeing to these rules, okay? Uh, before I show it. So uh, with that, uh, Andrew, if you would show our morning's commercial. <laughs> Sometimes I dream that he is me. You got to see that's how I dream to be. I dream I move, I move, I dream I groove like Mike. If I could be like Mike, oh, if I could be like Mike, like Mike. If I could be like Mike, be like Mike, be like Mike. We crossed new boundaries this morning as a church. Uh, I, along with millions of other young, impressionable minds, just wanted to be like Mike. Uh, and after watching that commercial as a child, I drew the apparent conclusion that the main difference between myself and Michael, disregarding 11 inches of height, athletic ability, and a strong personal desire driven for success, was that he had a better electrolyte balance than I had from all that Gatorade he was drinking, and I knew that was a problem that I could fix. So I will tell you a few dollars later, and a belly full of red dye 40, and I can now be like Mike. Oh, if only it were so easy, right? Now, it's not wrong uh, to have people that we want to be like, um, people that we want to emulate, but perhaps there are better criteria on which we would make our decisions other than one's ability to dunk a basketball. Uh, we're continuing our series this morning in the book of Acts, and last week, Pastor Adam shared with us the story of Peter and Cornelius, and um, the good news that the, that the Gentiles, that the non-Jews, uh, like many of us, I, I would assume, could be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, the Jewish leaders there in Jerusalem were skeptical, but, but they finally agreed that, that even Gentiles could be granted, and the phrase that was used was repentance that leads to life. And as Pastor Adam told us last week, they were in. So we'll be in the, the back half of chapter 11. If you want to turn there or scroll there in your Bibles, however you, you get there, uh, we'll be picking up in verse 19 this morning. Uh, and we're going to kind of see where the, the rubber meets the road uh, of this inclusion of the Gentiles. So theoretically, the Jerusalem uh, leaders could agree that Gentiles were part of God's plan, but what would it really look like for them to practically reach out to them? Our passage this morning isn't going to be terribly long, so we're actually just going to read the whole thing, and then we'll come back through it and break it down and see what we should learn. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw 
what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And they did this, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So here in in Acts chapter 11, we get the account of this young uh, startup church in the city of Antioch. And we'll see how this church will sort of go on to grow into a real place of prominence and influence as we continue through the the book of Acts together as a church. But they'll play a a significant role in the the missionary uh, work of the early church. And and I think the the success that they sort of found through their their missionary endeavors is, is rooted in the foundation that we see as the church is established and taking shape there in the city. So, so this morning, I think there are a couple of things about the church in Antioch that, that I want us to just sort of note because I think we can and should learn from them. Uh, I thought about uh, coming up with some lyrics that we could all sing together, I want to be, I want to be like Antioch, um, but uh, you don't want me to sing for you this morning. And, and the only benefit would be you would really appreciate Pastor uh, Ethan more after that. But... Um, there are some things here in, in Antioch and in uh, the Antioch believers that, that I think we would do well to emulate, that we would do well to model ourselves after both as a, as a church and as individuals. The first one is, is this. The church in Antioch excelled by demonstrating cross-cultural engagement. Verse 19, those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Gentiles, also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. The opening of this passage uh, sort of ties us back to the persecution that we saw earlier in the book of Acts and, and kind of one of the natural outcomes of the persecution that they were experiencing there in Jerusalem was a, a spreading of those early Christian believers uh, into new regions. Um, and they took with them uh, the mandate that Jesus had given them, the, the great commission to go and be his witnesses wherever it was that they went. And, and so Uh, We see um, highlighted last week that this included to the Gentiles, and this was what was demonstrated between Peter and Cornelius and and that story that we saw uh, last week. But what was still happening is most of the Jewish believers that were being scattered were still focusing on sharing the gospels with just the other Jews that they would encounter. Now, in their defense, uh, our our most common lane for evangelism is, is typically Um, going to be people that we share those areas of commonality with, particularly culture, uh, but certainly sort of ethnic and nationality. uh, As we see those those areas of of similarities, that does kind of open up natural lanes and convenient lanes of relationship. So uh, not faulting them. It wasn't like, oh, you're a Jew and they should run away. Um, But that that, that was who they were were, were naturally drawn to and, and could communicate with easily. If I had someone in my life that only spoke Swedish, and I'll just assure you my Swedish is terrible because I don't know any of it, uh, if I wanted to share the gospel with them, that, that cultural barrier would prove challenging. It would be much easier for me to, to presumably share the gospel with one of you in here that, that speaks uh, English. Sometimes we go outside of our culture. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where, where you are a minority in the culture and you are surrounded by people that speak a different language and have different cultural norms and, and you find yourselves in situations. It gets very uncomfortable very quickly. Uh, and we sort of, I think, instinctively are drawn back to those that are similar to us. And, and if you are in those places and you find somebody that, that speaks your language, you're like, ah, oh, we're best friends. I don't even know anything about you, but we're besties now. Uh, and so there is this inclination to go to, to that which is the same. But cross-cultural relationships take extra work. They take extra intentionality. 
Now, I get the, the impression for a lot in the, the early church, the, the exclusion of the Gentiles in their, their sort of gospel presentation may have been more motivated by sort of theology, um, that they, they didn't quite understand that that was a part of God's plan and, and probably less from sort of practical concerns or, or linguistic concerns or cultural concerns. But we see those early persecuted believers, as many of them are going to new places, that they are reaching out to people like themselves with backgrounds similar to theirs. But I will say personally, as a, as a Gentile, as I assume many in here are, thankfully not everyone from that early church community only reached out within their own culture. We're told some of them, however, uh, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks. They broke through the cultural barrier. They pushed cross-culturally into new areas. And, and whether it was this deeply intentional, like, hey, when we get to Antioch, we're going to go into this area and, and talk to these people, or they just had jobs and interacted with people, and that was just where they found themselves they took a bold step and they shared their faith and they shared their love of Jesus. And we see that God blessed their efforts significantly. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. It wasn't just that they did it or it was, it was, we're not pointed to their skill. Uh, clearly God was at work in the midst of their faithfulness and he blessed them with a great deal of people in that city that chose at that time to become followers of Jesus. And I would just uh, encourage you to remember this and to hear it sort of carefully. It's a good reminder that God does not call us to be effective evangelists. He calls us to be faithful evangelists. And sometimes we can overemphasize the role that we play in a a gospel-related conversation with someone and downplay the work of the Holy Spirit whose job it is to draw people to himself. And we are called faithfully to work in those moments, but it is the Holy Spirit that draws people and not our arguments. Now we're, given, we're, we're not given the impression that this group of, of Christians in Antioch had just read the latest scroll of three strategies to win the heathen uh, and three techniques that will succeed in evangelism. It, you just sort of get the sense that they love Jesus that he had changed their life and who they were and what he had done for them overwhelmed them to the point that when they met somebody, they talked about it and they shared about him. They met people that didn't know Jesus and that bothered them and they wanted them to know about Jesus. So they told them. We're told that in that God moved in the hearts of those that heard it in a way that brought them to a point of belief. I think we should learn from the early Antiochs, we are called to engage cross-culturally, to engage in missions cross-culturally. I will tell you, uh, I'm proud of sort of the long history of this church in supporting cross-cultural missions. Uh, In the past handful of years, we've sent some short-term missions teams to the Dominican Republic and Czech Republic, and uh, there's some more teams lined up to go in the future, and that's really exciting. It's written into our bylaws, I don't know if you knew this, that, that 17% of all the money that, that, is, that is given to the church automatically just turns around and goes to support missions. Um, some of that is, is local and domestic needs, but a, a big chunk of that is, is international and cross-cultural missions that we support. Uh, this past week, we had a, a church business meeting and we voted uh, to approve a, a budget that funds a new missionary from within our membership, a, a young lady uh, that wants to go and, and help minister to the nomadic people of Southern Asia. Uh, and she's gearing up to go and do that um, early, or next year. That's super exciting. As a church, we should be really excited for that. That is a good thing. That is an important thing. We are called to minister cross-culturally. I think we see that in the church of Antioch. But I would also add the caveat, for a lot of us, that's that's not maybe a calling that we are um, going to to pursue. Maybe you're not going to be on a short-term missions team, or maybe you're not going to go into full-time missions in another uh, part of the world. That's not what cross-culture engagement is necessarily going to look like for you. It may not be to to cross a national boundary or an ethnic, ethnic boundary, But for many of us, we are called to be cross-cultural in our day-to-day lives. It's more likely crossing a a social boundary, a cultural boundary, 
political boundary. This passage asks us, are you engaged in life on life with people that live differently than you do? Because the Antioch people did, and we saw how God worked through that. Do you have friends that voted differently than you in the last election? Do you have friends that understand human sexuality and gender differently than you do? Uh, I would worry for far too many of us, our evangelistic efforts are reserved only for those people that already agree with us. I think that goes against what we see in passages like this. We're to look at the example from Antioch that, that they didn't live their gospel lives in these preconceived boundaries and God blessed their faithfulness as they pushed beyond them. We see this church spring up in Antioch, which maybe you've heard uh, that, that name before as you've read through your Bible. And um, this actually isn't even the only Antioch that we will encounter in the book of Acts. I, I, I didn't quite realize how popular of a city name it was uh, back then. At that time, they, they think that there were about 16 different Antiochs. Um, so it's important to be like, which Antioch are you talking about? Um, but, but this one that we're seeing here is, is sort of the most significant one, it's the one we'll see most prominently throughout the book of Acts. It was actually the third largest uh, Greco-Roman city um, behind only Rome and Alexandria, so, so pretty important and significant city. Uh, Antioch was estimated to have about 500,000 people to be very metropolitan, very diverse culturally. Uh, and the more I read, the more people kept writing uh, how shocking they were that, that this is where uh, this church would break out that this was such an unlikely starting place for such an influential church. And um, I, I, as I was reading, people kept writing about like how stunned they were by sort of the levels of debauchery that the city uh, of Antioch was, was known for. Uh, and, and how could the church have gained a foothold in a city like this? How amazing um, that truly was. Uh, one book uh, actually ranked Antioch as the second most sinful city of its day, behind only Corinth, because, you know, Corinth, right? And, uh, but but they, they put them at, at number two. Um, and I will just say, I think this, we, we love to rank stuff. Like, what's the most? What's the top 10? I, I, I'll share with you a number of months back, I found uh, a list of rankings of the most sinful cities in the United States. Um, I will, you know, spoiler you with number one, that the city that calls itself Sin City shockingly topped uh, the list. Um, but I will admit to my own uh, personal joy when I found that the city of Anchorage ranked 88th um, and the city of Juneau came in at 109th where Fairbanks went unranked. So, uh, <laughs> the list did go to 182 cities, so we might have been 183rd. I, mean, I'm not even, I don't know, there's parts of this town. But, uh, <laughs> but maybe uh, I would be thoughtful to maybe not be quite so shocked or that it happened in a particular city. Oh, it happened in that really sinful city. How about we're just shocked anytime the church takes hold? Have you met people? Have you met the, the sinfulness of humanity? It is shocking that, that we are here at a church that has taken root and, and built a firm foundation in the city of Fairbanks, Alaska, because turns out it's full of sinners, right? And, and the same is true for Antioch. So uh, I don't know if we have to be so overwhelmed that, that God would work there. How about we're overwhelmed that God would work anywhere? And that's what we see. But we see in this city, in this debaucherous place known as, as Antioch, um, God is at work. And he's working across cultural lines. And, and this church breaks out and there's a group of people that call themselves followers of Jesus. And so now what? Picking up in verse 22. Well, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. And Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So somehow, some way, news of, of what's going on in Antioch uh, gets back to those who are in Jerusalem and uh, I, sort of mixed speculation uh, as I was reading about it. Uh, 
Some thought that this was sort of a, a young, overwhelmed church sort of reaching out to the big mother church saying, please send help, we don't know what we're doing. Um, others sort of speculated that it was that, that there were sort of some busybody sort of Jewish believers in Antioch that sent word back like, somebody better come down here and fix this because they're preaching to Gentiles here. And, you know, so, so whatever it was, word got back that something big was going on in Antioch. So we're told the, the, the Jewish church, or sorry, the Jerusalem church there decided to send uh, this man named Barnabas to Antioch to, to figure out what's going on, to, to get a read of the situation. I don't think for him it was short straw, like they all like, all right, who wants to go to Antioch? Like, oh, sorry, Barnabas, your, your straw was shorter than everybody else. Guess you're going to, the, you know, sinful Antioch. Um, I get the sense as they sort of describe him that, that he was picked for a purpose, that he was picked for a reason. It was because of who he was and what he was known for that they were like, you know who needs to go? Barnabas needs to go. They need our Barnabas. We were introduced to Barnabas earlier in our, our study of Acts in the early church uh, chapter four of, of the book of Acts and really unique time in the, the developing early church. We're told all believers were in one heart and mind and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had, which just sounds like a beautiful uh, time in the development of the early church. And very shortly after that, verse 36, we're introduced to Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And sold this, uh, Barnabas sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Pretty good backstory. Uh, if that's how people introduce you, you're off to a good start. Um, he was a Levite from the sort of the priestly tribe uh, of Israel, but we're also told he was from the, the, the region of, of Cyprus. Uh, and, and this would have been a place that wasn't Jewish. So uh, he would have been used to living sort of cross-culturally. Uh, and, and that's what he was going to experience uh, when they sent him to Antioch. Um, we're told about his disposition. He had a particular disposition. He was considered an encourager. Enough so that, that they nicknamed him that. This, his name is Joseph, but they, they call him Barnabas. And as somebody that was a younger brother and received many nicknames over the years, and many of which I won't share with you here in, in church, I would have loved if my brother was like, you know what we're going to call you? Son of encouragement. Yeah, that's your name because that's what you are. That's who Barnabas was. Enough so that they're like, yeah, Joseph's just not going to cut it you're son of encouragement and just deal with it, right? And I don't know, maybe you got the tattoo. I don't know how it worked from there, but uh, Barnabas was, was familiar with, with cross-cultural ministry. He had a, a naturally encouraging uh, personality and it seemed to the, to the leaders that he was the right person for the job. So he is sent down to Antioch to go and sort of suss out, uh, is something amazing happening there or is something gone off the rails and, and we've got to go and sort of rein it back in? When he gets there, we're, we're told that he finds uh, a young church that, that just needs some leadership and some encouragement. And it turns out he was very much the right guy for the job. And um, look at the description of him. When he arrived, uh, verse, 30, or verse 23, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. It wasn't a competition. It wasn't those in Jerusalem versus those in Antioch. He, he got there. He saw that God was working among them. He found joy in it, and he encouraged them to keep on going and keep on doing it. Not sure if we always see this uh, amongst um, sort of the Christian church. Now, we are called to, to guard and, and the doctrine and the beliefs of the church. It's one of the specific roles of elders uh, in the church. Uh, but I fear far too many uh, Christians are guarding what turns out to be preferences and not essential elements of their faith. I imagine that this may have been sort of the initial response of the Jerusalem church as they sent Barnabas, but Barnabas was the right guy to go there and help see what was going on and the goodness in, in what God was doing amongst these young believers in Antioch. And so he goes and says, these guys love the Lord. They need some help. I need some help. And so quickly and, and wisely, Barnabas decides that after establishing what's going on, that he's not the right guy for the job. He needed somebody. He needed somebody with a different skill set, with a, with a different gifting, with different abilities than he was blessed with. He was an encourager, but what this church needed was a teacher. 
and an equipper and a discipler. He needed somebody to train up these young Christians that seemed to be excited for what God was doing and, and, and unleash them on the world around them. So he went and found the person that he thought would be best for the job. He went and found Saul. Verse 25, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Disciples were called Christians first here at Antioch. And so I just think one thing we learn uh, from the, the Antioch church here is that they excelled in collaboration. Barnabas had things that he needed to do there. There, there was gifting that, that he brought that was beneficial but there were some other things that he realized he wasn't the best option for, and there's no shame uh, in that. If what this church needed was a teacher, then he should go and find the best teacher for them, somebody that was gifted in that area of ministry. So we're told that he pulled out his cell phone and he texted Saul and said, hey, next time you're in the area, if you could come by. I bet he wished that were true. We do enjoy some modern conveniences right now. And, and so he realized that what this young church needed was Saul. And so he said, I'm going to Tarsus. I don't know about how your Middle Eastern geography is, but Tarsus is about 100 miles from Antioch. Uh, and so I imagine that Barnabas grabbed his walking stick and got after it. And he went and he said, this is who they need. And I will go to great lengths, literally, to go and get him and talk to him and bring him back. Who better for this Gentile explosion that's going on in Antioch to, to oversee than the person that was tasked as the apostle to the Gentiles. And I think in this interaction between Barnabas and, and Saul, we, we see the beauty in God's design for the body of Christ, for the church. It wasn't built on one person that could do everything. It wasn't all on Barnabas' shoulders by himself. It's built on a group of people that love God, that, that have areas of strengths and gifts and areas of weaknesses and shortcomings, but are willing to collaborate and work together and, and, and be better off because of it. See, within the church, our differences become our strengths. We're stronger together than we are individually. We see all of the various areas and ministries that it takes for the church to be healthy and to be thriving. I'll say, unfortunately, uh, there, there can be too much of an emphasis on the preaching uh, ministry uh, of a church. Um, we, we tend to sort of find a, a preacher or a pastor and kind of latch on to, to them and their teaching, or whether it's sort of a celebrity pastor or, or uh, whatever, but we, we see them as that's how God works, um, I think that's a misunderstanding of what church is. Now, preaching and teaching are important ministries of the church. I certainly value them, but preaching and teaching exist to train up and to build up the body of Christ so that you guys are equipped to share the good news wherever you go. There's a multiplication of our efforts that way. If your understanding of evangelism is bringing people on a Sunday morning so they can hear me or one of the other pastors, you're missing the goal of what evangelism is. God has called each of us to be evangelists, to share the gospel with those that he has placed in our lives. We see all of the body needed in its various roles and gifting, working together to be at its strongest. And Paul and Barnabas, with their different goal, gifting and different abilities, made the church of Antioch stronger as they worked together. We're told for an entire year, they stayed and they taught and they preached and they encouraged and they built up so that this group of believers in Antioch could accomplish what God intended to accomplish with them. We get a cool line at the end uh, of verse 26. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's kind of a, a new piece of information here. Uh, there were a lot of names that followers of Jesus uh, went by or called themselves up to this point. And so we, we see those throughout scripture where uh, they would call themselves saints or believers or disciples or brothers or uh, Nazareans. But, but this is the first time that we see the word Christians used when talking about followers of Jesus and now, one thing we don't know, uh, the tone. It's hard in a, in a written uh, book to, to always know the tone. Were they called Christians or were they called Christians? You know, we don't know. Uh, was it a, a term of you know, endearment or a term of we're annoyed by you? We're not sure where it went, but, but either way, sort of the Christian community there in Antioch grabbed onto it, said, yeah, you know what we are? We're Christians. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I, I am 
like Christ. I am a Christ-like one. I am a, a little version of, of Christ is what I aim to be, and whatever Christ is is what I want to be. So whether you say it encouragingly or derisively, yeah, I'm a Christian. I want to be like Christ. But here's what I will tell you, those of you that would call yourselves Christians, it is a lot of a name to live up to. If you were the only Christian that somebody knew and and interacted with, what conclusions would they reach from their time with you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus? It's a bit more of a responsibility when we frame it that way that we would call ourselves Christians. And I would challenge you to consider in what ways do you need to grow as an ambassador, as a representative of Jesus Christ? If people around you are learning what it means to be a Christian by how you lived your day-to-day life, are you comfortable with what they're learning, with what they are concluding? While they were called Christians, are you willing to go by that same name? Are you willing to bear the burden of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and identify yourself as that? And, and I, uh, I think we live in, a, in sort of a culture right now, um, an American Christian culture, where a lot of people sort of just identify as Christians, but do we acknowledge what it means to call ourselves that? It's not just a cultural term. doesn't mean my grandma was a Christian. If you are a Christian, what does that mean to you as a representative of Jesus Christ? Because here's what I'll say about being called a Christian. It's a lot of name to live up to. It's a lot. We wrap up our our time uh, with Antioch this morning. I just want to highlight sort of one other area where I think the church excelled, and it was this. The, The church in Antioch excelled by demonstrating concern for others. Uh, Verse 27, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius, and the disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And this they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul." So we see the, the work in, in this section of a, uh, of a prophet in the Antioch church. Uh, I'll be first to confess it's sort of an area of God's work um, that kind of can make me uncomfortable at times. I don't fully understand um, all the, the elements of, of what was going on there. We're not told maybe as much as I would like to know, but we're told that a man uh, named Agabus was used by the Holy Spirit to predict that a famine would uh, break out in the land and severely impact that, that region. And like most tragedies, you, you see areas where it, it's more and, and less and not everybody got hit the same. And so as this is predicted, this young upstart church in, in Antioch decided that that they would give of their own physical needs and resources to meet the needs of other Christians, other brothers and sisters in Christ in in the region of Judea. And this would particularly highlight the city of Jerusalem. So I would just say, what a beautiful picture of what it means to be a a Christian. They could have heard the news that famine was going to break out, that things were resources were going to get scarce. I'm sure inflation might have been used in their, their conversation. And they could have made sure that their bank accounts were topped off, that they had enough sort of silver stashed underneath the mattress or that there was enough sheep in the flock to get them through a lean season to know that they were taken care of. But instead you see their care and concern for others on full display. And think about the uniqueness of this particular relationship between Antioch and and Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Not too long ago, Antioch needed the help of Jerusalem as sort of the big mother church, and they sent their resources and and Barnabas to help get this church established and on uh, firm footing. But now the tables are turned. It's the mother church that's in need. They need help, and they can't feed the people that they have who better to turn to and get help from than the church that they had loved on earlier? So was it perhaps a little humbling for the Jerusalem church to receive, you know, sort of the the, the giving and the generosity from the church in Antioch? Perhaps, might have been. But was it probably really good for them to be reminded that that God works and that God provides for them and that the church is bigger than, than just their four walls? We see a principle of giving that I just want to highlight here. Um, Each person gave, and we're told this, as each one was able, that's the phrasing uh, that was used. Some, perhaps a lot, others, perhaps a very small amount. 
There wasn't a percentage sort of mandated by Barnabas and Saul. Like, if you go to this church, you need to give, you know, seven oxen and three silver coins to our, you know, brothers and sisters in, in Jerusalem. God worked in their hearts to, to meet the need as it was out there. Sometimes as Christians, we like a simplistic understanding of giving. Uh, you often hear sort of the tithe talked about, 10%. Is that, that sort of is the, the gold standard. But, but I will say, the Bible teaches that at times, for some of us, 10% is far too much. And for others of us, 10% is far too little. See, we are called as Christians in our giving and in our, to do it cheerfully, to do it generously, to do it sacrificially. Uh, it doesn't fit easy on a, on a percentage. Um, we recognize that what we have is simply the gifts of God given to us, and, and we are entitled to, to then share those with others as each one was able. One of the hallmarks of the Christian church has been and should continue to be our dedicated and committed love for others, both within the walls of our church and outside the walls of our church, both within the culture that we find ourselves and beyond the culture that we find ourselves in. There's an old song you might have heard. They say they will know that we are Christians by our love. Is that really what Christians are known for now? Can we do better? Kind of concluding, wrapping up, what does it mean for you to be called a Christian? It's a tall order. We see that here in Antioch. We see it here in this young church. For them, it meant reaching beyond those cultural boundaries, pushing the gospel wherever life led them, sharing it with other people because they love Jesus and they know that they needed to know about Jesus. Meant working together and collaborating, Barnabas and Saul and recognizing strengths and gifting that others had and, and weaknesses that we have. It meant the churches working together and, and Jerusalem supporting Antioch and Antioch supporting Jerusalem when the time came. Not being embarrassed that we can't do everything by ourselves. Being a Christian to them meant being generous, sacrificially giving to, to, to meet the needs of others as each one was able not looking out for ourselves, not making sure that, that, that we're always cared for, but, but looking outside and, and, and meeting other people's needs, loving them. And I will say, when, when you find a group of people, as we seem to have found here in Antioch, that are doing those things, reaching out, working together, meeting needs, caring for others, I think you start calling those people Christians. I think that's what we are called to do. I hope that you would want to be like the church in Antioch, and, and, and we as a church, we, we are, and we can be, and we need to continue to do that. I hope that you would want to be like the, the young Christians in Antioch with their desire to share their love for Jesus. It didn't matter what the boundaries were in front of them, and God worked in that in a powerful way. They were young, and they didn't always know what they were doing. But they loved God, and they followed him faithfully. And we see when God works, God gets the glory, and that's a beautiful thing. Hope that you uh, can be encouraged by that this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this passage, for this encouragement, for this opportunity we have to, to just be reminded of what you call us to, to be reminded of what it means to call ourselves a Christian. It's not just a title. It's not just a nickname. It means something. Lord, when we are Christian, we are your ambassadors, we are your representatives, and we are called not to keep that to ourselves, we are called not to, to hoard it, we are called to share it, to go into places that are challenging and uncomfortable, and Lord, to do it because we love you, and to do it because we know that they need to love you. Heavenly Father, help us as we, uh, as we do this individually, this is certainly an encouragement to a church as a whole, but Lord, this is an encouragement to each and every one of us to, to be thoughtful about what our discipleship looks like what it looks like for us as we live as Christians in this world. What have you called me to? What have you called us to uniquely? Help us to have eyes to see where you're working, that we would trust that, that you can do great things when you choose to, that the burden of evangelism doesn't rest on our skill or our, uh, our wit, that the Holy Spirit is drawing people to himself, and you simply call us to be faithful. Lord, we ask for your help with this. This is far beyond uh, my ability to do in my own strength and our ability to do in our own strength. But as you work through us, Lord, we can accomplish great things. We ask for your help in Jesus' name, amen.